Good evening and welcome to the uh, October 27th West Seneca School Board meeting. We appreciate everybody coming this evening. And um, we'll start with the pledge, so if everybody could stand, and uh, Mary Bussey will lead us. Okay, so we changed our venue this evening. We are here at West Senior um, because we wanted to accommodate those people that wish to voice um, some concerns about what's going on in the district. So, um, and just to let you know that, let me just read this statement that we usually read at a board meeting. The public comments section, which is now, is time set aside for the community to speak directly to the Board of Education. You should note that uh, we're not going to talk about agenda meetings tonight, our agenda items. Um, the section, each speaker is given three minutes with a total lot of time to last no more than 30 minutes, and we might extend that 30-minute time frame, but you only have three minutes each to speak. When called, please step up to the podium and state your name and address. Please be respectful in your comments and do not divulge any personal or confidential information like people's names, specific situations, etc. Board members and the superintendent and the administrators will not answer specific questions or engage in dialogue. The information shared will be carefully considered and the appropriate person will contact you. If you'd like to be contacted, please leave your information with the district clerk. Okay, so do we have anybody that would like to come up to the, we have a little cart rather than a podium. Oh, okay, we have the microphones, okay. So, okay, I don't know if we have a list tonight, but if somebody would like to come up and. Do you want this on or off with a mic? If, if you're speaking to the microphone, just because multiple people will be using it, if you would keep the, the mask on, that'd be great. Okay, you got it. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sally San George. I live at 171 Royal Coach Road. I have a senior and a sophomore here at West Senior. Both of my girls have excelled in, schooling, in the schooling program here since day one. From the moment the remote only option was given to our town, my mind has been spinning. Immediately knowing how much my senior was going to miss out on broke my heart. I have been very vocal ever since the announcement, trying to get anyone to listen. Social media became an all-out war with parents attacking each other for their opinions. I, for one, have nothing against people who wish to keep their children home. I only asked for the choice to give my child an in-school option. Knowing that 70% of the district wanted the in-school learning, it should have been your first priority to figure out a plan and get them back. We have now had two extra months to watch our neighboring districts to see what is and what is not working. Let's use this knowledge and implement a better system for our children. There's no perfect plan, but there is and has to be a better way than one day a week instruction her class for high school. I understand that our four block a day schedule causes problems and if that's the case then it's time to go back to an eight period a day schedule or implement live stream cameras during classes so when they're not in school they're watching and interacting from home. Now I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I have two high school students who need little to no help from me with remote learning. I can't even imagine the parents with special needs and elementary age children trying to cope with all of this. People's emotions are running high, which is no surprise. This board is supposed to speak for parents and children of this community. Our children are suffering from all of this mess. Please bring us a change that works. Thank, Thank you very much. Would someone else like to speak? 
just come up to the one of the microphones. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Craig Dana. I live at 138 Allendale Road. I have a junior at West Senior and an eighth grader at West Middle. Thank you for opening this meeting so we could speak today. I appreciate it. Back on July 8th, the district wrote about reopening planning sessions involving faculty and staff. Who was on those committees? How often did they meet? Are they still meeting? And what did they accomplish over the summer? In the same letter, the district wrote about soliciting feedback from staff, families, and students. Did that happen, and what feedback did you get? On September 30th, in a video message, the district discussed returning elementary students back to school. They mentioned forming some committees that are going to include a variety of stakeholders to include administrators, teachers, civil service employees, board of ed, and families. Why were they formed so late in September? Who is on those committees? When and how often did they meet? And what work did they do? In the same September video message, the district said, and I quote, I haven't mentioned grades six through 12 as of this point, and I will tell you they're coming. But right now, we wanna be able to focus our resources, our energy on working to get our elementary students back for some in-person instruction. We are one month into school and you have not put any energy or resources in bringing back your secondary students, my two secondary students, this is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that today, October 27th, the students of West Seneca do not have a detailed hybrid plan. We don't want a garbage plan thrown together in the last minute. We need specific details like PPE, safety procedures, cohorts, busing, food service, teacher assignments, bell schedules, I don't understand this Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Thursday, Friday structure. With the cohorts together Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they'll be out of school five days in a row. Also, how does your plan work with the high school block schedule? Will my son see his phys ed teacher just every couple weeks? Why not every other day or Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday? Our hybrid plan must also allow the students to transition from hybrid to remote and back again. There should also be a full remote option that preserves the continuity of those students' current educational programming. If students have to change teachers, that's your fault for poor planning in August. These are not impossible tasks. Just ask Clarence, Lancaster, Orchard Park, Kenton, almost all surrounding schools had this in place in August. These surrounding schools have had students back in their buildings since September or already are bringing them back. In West Seneca, January is too late for our secondary students. All we've heard is that full remote would last through Thanksgiving, which is 30 days away. The next 30 days will define what you value, how hard you'll work for the students in this district that need more than just fully remote education. 30 days, plus all of August, September, and October should have been plenty of time to get all West Seneca students who choose hybrid back on campus by at least December 1st. Get to work and get that done. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tracy McCormick. I live at 64 Wedgwood Drive in West Seneca. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you regarding the current school reopening plans for West Seneca. My husband and I have had children in the West Seneca school system since 1990. That's right, 30 years since his oldest son started kindergarten to our daughter being a junior this year. We have loved our experience with West Seneca and have been blessed with many amazing teachers. But my focus is not on the past, but how this situation will affect my daughter's future. As I stated, my daughter is a junior. And as all of you know, junior year is so very important when applying for colleges and scholarships. They look, they reference your junior year 
class ranking and GPA, they look at your extracurricular activities and community involvement. When filling out these applications, she will have many entries for freshman and sophomore year. But her junior year, her most important year, will be empty if this continues. There will be no school musicals, no club officer positions, no community club involvement, nothing outside of her GPA. And you could say that all students will have those issues, but they won't. She is not competing only against West Seneca students or even New York State students, but students across the United States for these valuable scholarships and college admissions. And we all know that the number of scholarships offered will be down and the number of applicants who will be, will be up due to the current economic situation. Now, not all parents, not allowing students and parents to have the option to attend school in person from the beginning has created a snowball effect that will carry on for years to come. The lack of hands-on learning with labs for those students who want to pursue scientific studies to the missed athletic events that will prevent scouts from recruiting and earning scholarships for those students who would not be able to pursue their education otherwise. We cannot change what is past, but we can make more of an effort to be there for our students in the future. It's your job as board members to give all students the best opportunity to succeed. According to the Erie County Health website, there have been 362 positive COVID cases in West Seneca, a city with a population of 45,325 in 2018. That's a 0.7% infection rate, 0.7%. 70% of the parents have been very clear that they want their kids back in school. There is no reason that we cannot work together for our students and give them all the benefits any other school, academic excellence, extracurricular involvement, and athletic achievement that they will receive during this school year. I implore you, on behalf of my daughter and others like her who need an in-person school experience to give them the tools not only to get into, but to succeed in college. Work with the parents, work with the students, work with the teachers, but give us a solid plan to bring our students back. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacy Simmons, and I live at 123 Chancellor Lane, and I have children in elementary school. In September, I was very proud and supportive of our district. I thought for sure West Seneca made the correct call after seeing Orchard Park have all students in grades K through three go to school five days a week. I thought that they would have a surge in COVID cases. Guess what? They didn't. And I'm sure that you guys all see firsthand that Orchard Park, sorry, that those cases did not spread. No one else in the school or those classes at three different schools where positive cases were found had COVID. After closely following Orchard Park, I continually ask myself, and I ask all of you here, why do Orchard Park students deserve better than my children and the children that you serve here in West Seneca? Mr. Bystrap, how would your children adjust if they were students in West Seneca following this plan? What science is behind phasing in of students? Are you aware that under the current plan, children in cohort B with the last names M through Z will go to school for two days and then be off for two weeks. That's my son. And they will only have 40 days of instruction for the remainder of the school year versus cohort A that would have 49. Will the schedule be adjusted to balance this? Why do schools that do not have UPK, like West Elementary, have to have a whole week where no new students are introduced? Can we phase in by entire schools rather than grade levels over the course of seven weeks? For instance, self-contained students of all ages at UPK first, and UPK first, followed by elementary students, and so forth. This plan would have all students returning by the end of November, and that would make a lot of people here and standing outside pretty happy. What is the purpose of a deep cleaning day? Other neighboring districts have alternate days, like Orchard Park, or they have set days, like Clarence. For instance, can we have our cohorts 
alternate Wednesdays. This would give students an extra day of school and interaction every other week, only giving us about 14 extra days, which my kids would truly appreciate. The district announced that we have over 3,000 plexiglass barriers that were purchased. If our district spent that money, why aren't these being taken into consideration? In a lot of cases, these eliminate the need for six feet, some instances masks, so why not bring all kids back five days a week? Let's talk teacher changes. Why would these even be necessary? Can't students be divided up per class? Was this not taken into consideration since March? Why put unnecessary stress on our already burdened children and families? Some other questions that people have asked me to present. How is the district allowing sports but not allowing students to come back in person? What is the plan after hybrid? Will or can lessons be streamed at home for students wishing to watch in? Will there be office hours with the teachers for the days students are not present in school? Please bring our kids back before December. We have to do better, and you guys have to do better. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Molly Dana, 138 Allendale Road. Thanks for letting our voices be heard tonight. We love our district, we love our teachers, and we love the comprehensive education our boys have received in West Seneca. Advocating comes easy when you value public education. But I stand before you today with a lump in my throat and a heavy heart. Usually our fight is with the state and federal education departments or our politicians, but tonight is different. I have two basic reminders to our superintendent and board members. A, the role of the superintendent is to lead the district in all aspects of his responsibilities based on the values of our community. B, the role of the school board is to ensure that our superintendent is indeed leading the district with the community's values at heart and through action. 70% of parents responded to a survey communicating how we value our children being back in school in September. You ignored the parents' voice and you took away our choice by not offering a hybrid and fully remote model in August. The lack of leadership, planning, honesty, communication, and self-reflection is disheartening. What's more disturbing is leadership's inability to answer simple questions about the process or plans presented. It's either incompetence or arrogance when you don't feel you need to respond to parents' questions and concerns. COVID-19 has significantly impacted everyone's lives, but parents in this community have been left in a deeper crisis because of our district's lack of planning. This remote model is not working for the majority of parents and students. The family structure has been altered because children are often left alone in front of Chromebooks when parents have no choice but to work. Kids are left with little to no support at home. The social and emotional needs of every student are not being met. Kids are not built to be learning this way. A full day of learning remotely is not a comprehensive education. The stories of frustration, lack of motivation, and depression are everywhere in this district. As parents, we have done our homework by reading the reopening of schools guidelines put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, and the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. In conclusion, all organizations are in agreement. Every school district's reopening policy should start with the goal of having students physically present in school. Everyone in this room, everyone, is responsible to work together to be problem solvers. I always say to my boys, don't panic. There is a solution to every problem. It's your responsibility to find solutions. We wouldn't be in this mess if you asked others to be part of the solution. As a matter of fact, my husband and 16-year-old son, in one hour, 
we're able to, to take Orchard Park's hybrid model, apply it to West Senior's block schedule, and make it work. If we expect our students to always work hard, to try their best, and take responsibility for their actions, I think it's only fair that we ask the same of all of you. Before I end, I will leave you with three questions. And if you could wrap it up. Okay. Yep. One, have you worked hard to meet all the needs of all of our children? Two, have you tried your best to find solutions? And three, will you take responsibility to ensure our children have a sensible hybrid plan to return to school before January 4th? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Carol, there's somebody at this microphone. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Hi, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, can you speak directly into the microphone? Maybe move it down a little bit so we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Lisa Walzak. I live at 2647 Clinton Street, and I have a kindergartner at Winchester Elementary. I previously emailed Superintendent Bystrack with no response regarding this issue. What resources will be implemented going forward for kids who can, cannot log on to their live sessions during the day for the virtual model? A lot of live sessions are made up of class discussion. When these live sessions are missed due to parents working, not having sufficient Wi-Fi, etc., all of the material that is missed, there's no way for them to gain that material back. Going forward, how can we make the live session material accessible after hours so all students have equal opportunities? We were assured and reassured that there were resources coming at the beginning of the school year, or at least being looked into, but where are they? Is there an update on them? Thank you. Carol Jarzik, 151 Laurelton Drive. I'm just standing here on behalf of a young mom that was outside that couldn't come in. Her concern is why are special needs kids starting on the west side of town, I believe she said, later than the east side of town? Why aren't they both starting together? She's got a huge concern. She said the more the time that goes on, the more her, her son is going to be behind. And I'm very close to many special needs kids, and they need that one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's a hard decision for all of you guys. I can't even imagine, you know, what do you do? One way, one parent's going to like it. Another way, another parent's going to like it. I don't know how you meet the middle. Good luck to all of you. I am sad. I've lived in West Seneca for 45 years now. I'm sad to see the disrespect out there tonight. Not, not from everybody, and they, a lot of them had great things, but I was sad to see that. I'm sad to see Facebook some of the cracks and the personal things against you guys. Come on, West Seneca, we're better than that. Okay, would someone else like to speak? No one else? Okay, thank you for your comments. Mr. Bystrad, if you would like yeah. to comment now. Yeah, I'm just going to take off my mask because I'm the only one using this microphone tonight. So, uh, first of all, um, I can appreciate the perspectives that everybody's voiced tonight. All right. And I can understand being frustrated that the kids aren't in school right now. Um, I'm going to try to address broadly some of the questions that were asked tonight. I didn't hear any questions that I didn't think were good questions. Um, I will tell you that, you know, and I'm not to rehash the whole past, but this started off uh, primarily as a safety concern. And absolutely, uh, we have seen that there has not been any widespread infection among different school districts throughout the area, and I'm very happy to announce that. Uh, back over the summer, somebody had said to me, boy, if the worst thing that happens is that people said we were too cautious to start off, um, I guess I'll, I'll take that heat. Um, when then we quickly looked into the idea of what educational program could we offer. Um, one of the difficulties we're balancing right now is we offer quite a bit of contact time with teachers um, every day. And I've had teachers that have indicated their concern that, you know, in moving to a hybrid model, frankly, it's going to slow things down quite a bit. Um, and I will be the first to say that there's a difference between the in-person 
interaction and then learning online. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. You don't have to convince me or I think anybody sitting up here of that. But I will say uh, that there are so many teachers have said we were right on target in terms of our curriculum. Kids are getting it. The attendance is good. Um, and you're not, I, I, I'm, the purpose of me saying all that is not to try to defend whatever position we've taken. Um, I will say um, that you know we have a model in place right now that students are engaging in, and it's not ideal. This is not a perfect situation, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think there's any school district that has it figured out. Um, you know, if a student doesn't have any contact with a teacher on a day, that's something we're trying to avoid, and as is the case with so many school districts. We want our students to have meaningful daily contact. We've been saying that from the start, and that's something we are striving toward. Um, I think also over the past few weeks we have realized some new capacities from a technological standpoint, which we kind of suspected may happen as people got more comfortable with the modality of accessing kids through Google Meets and things like that. So from that standpoint, we are trying to create something. And honestly, next week we'd like to be able to make some announcements in terms of more spe uh, specifics as far as planning is concerned. We've set the time frame. Um, but we'd like to be able to make some announcements that are going to also result in me uh, daily meaningful contact between students and teachers and not having off days where there is no contact between students and teachers. And, I mean, and, and that's not to say there's no learning taking place on those days. I will say that if students, you know, just because they're not talking with a teacher doesn't mean that some of that you know, independent exploration doesn't result in new learning. I believe that it does. Um, but one of the things that we focus on very deeply uh, somebody had asked the question of what steps are you taking to meet all the students' needs. Um, social emotional learning is a big one, and you know, there's a number of steps that we have taken to meet those needs. Um, as far as specifics, and as far as uh, 70, 70, approximately 70% 70 of parents that back in, I believe it was June when we surveyed families, it may have been a little later than that. Um, absolutely, I said that at our last board meeting. I'm not hiding from that, I'm not running from that. Um, and I will say that we have engaged some stakeholders at the elementary level, and we'll be engaging stakeholders, including families, uh, which is actually one of the reasons that we did have uh, a vote to families versus the half day versus full day hybrid. Um, we will be discussing uh, with some secondary parents uh, later this week, actually having some conversations about uh, some potential options that we may have, to, again, to try to provide that meaningful daily contact uh, between our families uh, and our, uh, I'm sorry, our students and our teachers. Uh, that still remains a goal for us. Um, I just, uh, really quick, uh, Carol, I just want to say that the resumption of uh, self-contained classroom programming in terms of the east and west side of town, it's not based on side of town. Honestly, it's based on program. And there are kids coming back on both sides of town. Really, it's just a matter of you know, when they return. Some of the classes are more integrated. So we're taking the kids, like our first, or uh, some of our English language learners started up uh, this past, yesterday actually, they started up coming back into school. And, and we have some students coming in from UPK and then self-contained classrooms. Um, people are asking, why is it that you're taking you know, so long to phase everybody in? Well. We have a model in place right now that is providing a great deal of contact with students. So to bring the kindergartners in, uh, you know, and you really get them acclimated to the environment the following week, you know, one, two, and to roll from there. Um, I know some had asked questions about, you know, amount of contact time, a number of days. And if you're in a different cohort, that absolutely is something we're looking into. Uh, our plan is to communicate a calendar for the year that does sort of equalize and balance things out for our students. So that's not something we're blind to. Uh, we have to start somewhere, so that's when we want to start bringing our kids back in. But uh, we did prioritize over the summer some of the younger kids being the ones that would need to be uh, most be in need of uh, the support and service coming back in. So I just, and again, as far as an academic standpoint is concerned, you know, again, we have teachers right now that are saying, we get it, we know that we need to bring our kids back in. You know, it's just, it's a tough pill to swallow in some cases when you're losing a lot of contact time with students potentially, which is why we're working so diligently. I don't mind. I, I feel it's appropriate to take a little bit more time to plan and offer something that is going to offer that daily contact as opposed to putting out a, a hybrid plan where there'll be windows of time, whether it be on you know, Tuesdays and thir uh, Thursdays or Fridays or you know, uh, Thursdays and Fridays or Mondays and Tuesdays, that there's those periods of time where they're not having the interaction with the teachers. So, um, you know, there was a lot of things that were said here tonight, and I, again, I, I'm not really looking to challenge what you're saying. I just want to be able to give you some level of rationale behind the decision-making process. Um, if someone's asking someone to take responsibility for it, I'll, I'll own that responsibility. And I'll take it a step further. Uh, over the summer, um, I don't believe, we did engage a lot of stakeholders, but I don't believe we engaged families the way that we needed to over the summer. I'm just owning that. I'm saying that I don't think we did that to the extent that we should have. 
Uh, but that said, when we started looking at some of the statistics that we feared in terms of safety, and then the educational program that we feared in a hybrid model, that's where we made the decision. So, and that's why we have involved some families in the decision-making process uh, for the fall in terms of a, a hybrid return, which at this point is as much as our district has the capacity to be able to offer. So, I think that's, that, that's pretty much it for me, Ms. Spears. Okay, thank you very much. And we appreciate all of your comments. And we, we do take them to heart. Um, we do want what's best for the students, for your children, and for the other children in the district. And um, we, we are listening, so just know that. All right, uh, we have a couple presentations this evening. So we have Sue Whalen from our Food Service Department. So is Sue here? I just go over here or here? Or you can use um, this mic up over here if you want. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you for having me. I have a, um, was given a list of questions um, asked by the board pertaining to the food service department. So I'd like to just run through them and answer them for everybody. Um, first question, uh, what new ideas have you implemented in the food service department. Um, currently, we are delivering to all our free and reduced students daily to their houses, any child that qualifies for free and reduced lunches. Um, any student that does not qualify, we are offering free meals at two locations, which is West Elementary and East Middle School. Um, and that is open to any child under the age of 18. It doesn't necessarily have to be a district student. And that is the same with all the school districts. We were given, um, we were granted a waiver, a New York State waiver, um, and we, New York State opted to use this waiver, um, and it qualifies every child for free meals. They initially said it was till the end of December, they extended it to the end of the school year. So no matter what the learning situation is, in school, out school, all children in New York State will have free lunch, free breakfast for the entire school year. Um, so. And it's at a higher rate than the normal school year for state and federal reimbursement. Um, what safety measures will be in place for the return of students to school? Once we shift the students to coming back on campus in per for in-person instruction, we will shift our meal service. We're currently developing a plan for when that takes place. Ideas include, but are not, but are not limited to, serving lunch in school on days students are present, all meals are be are to be prepared with safety measures in place. Gloves and masks are always worn. They're currently worn now at all times um, in packaging, prepping, wrapping, and distributing of all meals. This will continue when meals are served hot for students in school. The kitchen is sanitized daily by the food service staff and the maintenance staff also is doing a very good job of making sure everything is clean daily. Um, I'm going to skip number three and go to four, and then I'll do the PowerPoint for number three. As weather gets more wintry, what will be used for food packaging as opposed to paper? Um, currently, we Monday through Friday, we use a paper bag, a brown paper bag, and we put their breakfast and lunch in it. Um, on Fridays, we serve three meals, a meal for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and those are put in the typical grocery bags. And we will continue to use those bags um, when we shift to our second phase of this so-called, I guess you'd say, <laughs> where we um, plan on just feeding. Once the kids come back to school, my plan is to just hand out one bag once a week, and it's a five-day meal bag. And students will get fed the two days they're in school, breakfast and lunch, and then they'll get a five-day meal bag. Parents will have to come and pick it up at grab-and-go stations because delivery will no longer be happening because we have to bus our students. Um, and they can come and get a meal bag to take care of the other five days the students are not in school. So that's the current plan for that. Um, what is currently being done to ensure students with allergies are not impacted by food delivery? Um, my cooks and bus drivers and bus aides are working very, very close with each other. Um, the cooks all have a list of any child that has an allergy um, and they give it to the bus driver. They have an actual box that they put allergy specific lunches in. And then the names are given to the drivers and the drivers have the addresses. So when they get delivered, they have the proper meals. So 
and so far it's been, I'd say, 95% effective. I've had one or two, parents have called, we've corrected it right away, and I haven't heard anything since. Um, why is food individually packaged being used? Is this cost efficient? So, we've always used individually wrapped breakfast food. Um, it's never been that we cook it and unwrap it. Breakfast food has always come pre-packaged. Um, and then managing wrapping and packaging, it's, it's a great amount of work. Um, the workload and the type of work, it's very heavy work for the staff. Um, and they have doing the, been doing this since March, have not missed a beat. Um, and it's an added layer of protection, having it pre-wrapped coming to us um, against contamination. Um, and it preserves my labor force too. Not as much labor in packaging. We do have to package most of the lunch products as those stu that stuff that comes in that we have to actually you know, prepare. So it's not individually, individually wrapped per se. And like the fruit, they have to portion that up and stuff. But having the breakfast food individually wrapped, it's less labor on my staff preserving some of the labor hours. Um, how is the collection of outstanding funds being handled? Um, as you all know, I'm new to the district and I've looked at outstanding funds. There is a very, very large amount of outstanding funds owed to the district by parents. Um, every Friday, there's a robocall that goes out to any child that has an outstanding balance. A phone call goes out to the parents. Um, we have gotten a few, but I can say that most do not answer, do not pay. So I can assure and tell you that that's what's been happening with that. Um, and number three, how, are, how do we get appropriations for weekend delivery? What is it costing us on a weekly basis and where are the extra funds coming from? So this is where my PowerPoint that I put together. Um, we began sending meals home, three meals home on Fridays to cover Saturday and Sunday. Per USDA guidelines, under the waiver, we are allowed to feed students every day, including weekends and holidays. These meals are fully reimbursed from the state and federal aid. Having solid numbers every day, including weekends, will generate more revenue for the district that we would not otherwise have before this. This is a service to our family and communities who may be laid off and looking for meals to feed their children during difficult times. The rate of reimbursement is currently at the summer rate, which is much higher than the typical school year rate. Um, meals during the regular school year are reimbursed by eligibility. Free and reduced, we're, reduced, we're reimbursed at the highest level, and then students who don't qualify for free and reduced and pay full price are reimbursed at only a fraction of that. Um, so while we're providing this service to our families and community, we're also being very conscious of labor hours and meal preparation. Um, I've been evaluating this on a regular basis and we want to ensure we are bringing revenue into the district. So then I have the power, is this what I used for the PowerPoint? So I'm just going to um, compare September last year to September this year just to kind of give everyone a little idea. of. So September 19th, there was 18 serving days in the school year. Breakfast, that's, we served 13,000 breakfasts, about 38,000 lunches. Total of 51,000 meals were served September 2019 for 18 days. September 2020, we only had 16 serving days. We served 37,957 breakfasts, just about the same for lunches. Total meals of about 75,000. And that's all with delivery and um, grab and go. So you can see the, quite the difference there. Um, reimbursement rate for 2019, breakfast, Free or reduced breakfast, the state was reimbursing us $1.94. Um, for a paid breakfast, the state was only reimbursing us 31 cents. That's where I meant only a fraction of the cost. Um, lunch, we were reimbursed $3.56 for free, $3.54 for reduced, and only 47 cents for paying customers. So total for one meal that we reimburse daily is $5.50 for free, 548 for the reduced and only 78 cents for our paying population. So here's the reimbursement rate for 2020. Every breakfast is reimbursed at $2.37. Every lunch is reimbursed at $4.15. So the total for one meal is $6.52, which is about a dollar more than 
during the school year, and this is for all students because everybody qualifies for free meals. So meal prices, um, 2019, breakfast and lunch are free, um, for free and reduced, I'm sorry. Paid is $1.45. Lunches, for free and reduced, there's no charge, and paying customers pay $3.45. So if you add that $3.45 to what the state reimburses us, it's still a lot less than what we're being reimbursed right now. Meal prices for 2020, breakfast, free, lunch, free. So it's no cost to any student in the district. Um, September 2019, um, there was 18 serving days. We were reimbursed $23,877 from breakfast, and then $101,282 for lunch. That's what the state reimbursement, federal and state reimbursement was. September 2020, 16 serving days. Um, expected reimbursement for breakfast, 89985 Expected lunch reimbursement, 157563 So you can see it's quite a different reimbursement rate. So that's just to assure that it's all being fully reimbursed. It's of no cost to the district to do this. Um, So this is October. So October 1st, we started feeding the weekends where we send home three meals on Friday. So if there's 31 serving days and we do approximately 2,300 in a day, we're looking at 71,300 meals for one month at a reimbursement rate of $2.37 per meal, gives us $168,981 just for breakfast. And then you can see lunch, about the same for meal service. $4.15 a meal. Um, projected reimbursement is $295, um, $95, and that's probably about $200,000 more than September. Um, so that's kind of the reason I went to the seven-day meal bags. Um, I think it's a, a service to the community, and um, it's helping the district bring in revenue, which is our ultimate goal. Um, and that is um, a Monday through Friday bag, let's say. You have a, a full breakfast and a full lunch. And then on the weekends, we give three meals. So we have three milks, three juices, three fruits, three breakfast meals, and three lunch meals. Um, we keep it simple for breakfast, obviously, um, at low cost. You know, crackers are very low cost and cereals low cost, and that's what I mean about the prepackaged food. Um, but that's how it always comes in, whether the kids are in school or not. Um, that's all I have. I think I answered all your questions. Does anyone else have questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you, you stated that all students in West Seneca are, are eligible for a yes. lunch? Okay, mm -hmm. because right now it's only, uh, I would assume, I think it's only the free and reduced or are getting it. Not every child's getting it that I know of. Correct. Um, free and reduced are being delivered by the bus, right. by transportation, but everybody is eligible, so everybody else who does not qualify for delivery can come to one of the grab and go sites oh, okay. every day and get meal for free Thank and the you. student doesn't necessarily have to be in the district either um, okay. you know if it's someone under the age of 18 you know in their home they're entitled to free meals too that are fully reimbursed all right perfect thank okay. you mm -hmm. thank you anything else We try to keep the price of breakfast and lunch combined under $2. Uh, our, our cost all in? Yes, because um, a lot of our food is um, USDA commodities okay. that we get from the USDA. Um, and we get those commodities awarded to us yearly based on the number of meals we served the year before. So this year, it's very important to keep our numbers up, whether the kids are in school or out of school, because the next year, our award amount of money from the USDA for their products will continue to be a high number. Okay. Okay. So is it all in that price or is that just the cost of the food? That's the cost of the food. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do we have additional numbers on the labor delivery costs? Um, no, I, I look at that daily um, of you know my labor. Labor is what I really try and keep down. Um, I, and I look at Friday, they're packing three meals for Saturday and Sunday. I'm not using any labor for Saturday and Sunday, so that's a savior right there because they're not coming to, to work to, 
prepare meals on the weekends. Um, I don't. Correct. I know once the kids do start coming, we won't be busing anymore. We'll just be doing the grab and go sites. Um, but this was decided um, at the beginning of the year that this was a service we thought we could provide to our um, free and reduced population. Yeah, in advance of, of Sue starting up with us. Yeah. I have a question oh. for you. Yeah. Um, what is uh, the solution at that you're looking at it to collect some of these funds in arrears? To be honest with you, I haven't really gone that route yet. I'm just concentrating on what I have to do right now for these children. And the sigh of relief was we're not going to incur any more debt this school year because everybody is free. Um, but my, you cannot shame a child and tell a child they can't have a meal. So you have to feed them. Um, and attempt to collect the money. You can't feed them an alternate meal because they don't have money. And we ask parents um, to pay. We send letters and phone calls. The only thing I could think of was, you know, they can't go on field trips if they owe money or they can't graduate. You know what I mean? It has to be a solution that administration and I would have to come up with. Someone would have, you know what I mean, obviously back me on that. Funds do need to be collected, but some of the outstanding balances are very, very high. Yeah. Do you have a list? Yeah, I can run a list. It doesn't have to be public or anything. I'm just curious how that would dollar amount would be referring to. I can run lists by schools. Probably speak for everyone. We don't want any kids not be fed. Exactly. But there's obviously something you need to look at. Where is it? Do we need to reach out to the family more? Do we need any? Maybe, maybe if they're not paying, but maybe they qualify, then you still have an application. Right. And that and is. Not yeah. Do that. No, I was going to say that that does happen. I, I mm -hmm. it does. I can, I can to Matt and he can show it to everyone. Yeah, when I was doing, I wasn't talking about the public shame of it. I just hear saying that we're making phone calls, we're doing robocalls, we're just throwing good money after bad if we ain't collecting. So there has to be a different solution Correct. of what we're going to do. And I don't think I want to take away somebody's field trip because they can't afford something. Right. But I think we need to come to a demeanor where we're going to either balance this account out right. and start fresh and monitor it and not let it get past a certain point. If I think I have a number in my head of where it is, we you know, and what we've thrown in over the years, we've right. really never addressed this issue um, over the years. So I'm just, you know, looking for other ways. And when Absolutely. we have this chance, you're coming in new. I'm always looking for somebody outside the box, thinking something different. Right. Uh, you mentioned your things about different food colors and things that you want to run your right. program. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for, something revive and starting all over. Right. So. Um, Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay. When, when there is a situation of accounts that are maybe, uh, I know we sell more, and this is when kids are in school. Mm -hmm. I know we sell more than just lunch. Yes. I, I believe we still do ice cream and chips, but I'm not sure what the uh, variety of non-basic lunch items that right. we offer. Um, but are those are those also allowed to be purchased, or is it just lunch? Like you say, if, if a child. Right. Um, no, they are not allowed to purchase ice cream or chips on a credit because that isn't a reimbursable lunch for us. So, so to say, we just sell that, make very little money on it. So we can tell a child, no, you can't buy ice cream. You know what I mean? On account, you know, on and owe it to us. Well, Only sure. the lunch and breakfast. Yep. Yeah, we sell like chips and ice cream. Um, we don't make a lot of money on it. You know, we make more money some, on our breakfast and lunches. Okay. It's, it's not a priority selling the snacks. It's kind of just a little added bonus. Being a guy who likes chips and ice cream, <laughs> I consider trying to make a little more profit off the We can look at that. <laughs> Um, can I have a question? Um, once we stop the delivery, but all the students are not in school, what's going to happen with the staff? The food are, service are, staff? Is the whole staff still going to be, you know, have uh, things to do? 
Yes. Um, I mean, it, it changes daily based on, you know, which schools are going to have students in it and which aren't, and then how many. I also have to evaluate, you know, if we're only going to have 20 students, I'm not going to put the whole cafeteria staff at that building. But we're doing the five-day meals, which will take a lot of packaging, mm. and I'll utilize staff at other buildings to package that, you know, to wrap all the food, you know, on when they're not serving because they don't have as many kids. Um, I do still plan on utilizing my staff, and I also – plan on calling our monitors back too. Um, they can help with delivering meals to classrooms because I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of classroom feeding and also handing out the, the grab and go because we're still gonna have grab and go okay. until all students are back full time every day. And how is the morale from the staff? I know it's, they have very different jobs now. They do, they do. Um, so it's gotta be stressful for them. And it was very hard having someone new come in and mm -hmm. then them also doing new things. Um, but I make sure I'm there. I go to each one of my buildings every week, and I talk with them. Um, I've met with my cook several times, and I am all about you, you know, input, input. And, you know, they know we're all in this together. It's new to all of us, so it's trial and error. And I think they've been pretty happy with how the plan we've come up with. And they've done a great job, too. Okay, great. Yeah, we, we appreciate what they're doing. I mean, it's really a great service to the community. I just was wondering about the reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Will that situation change after the pandemic? Well, right now it will not change until at, after June 30th, 2021. So that's in, in place for the whole year where yes. we're getting reimbursed for all of the meals that are being yep. served to everybody. They initially, it's a good thing. <laughs> initially in August, it was until December 31st. Right. And then in mid-September, end of September, I would say they extended it until the end of the school year now. That's great. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have another question. Okay. So, so you said that um, the grab and go, so when our students are in full day hybrid, how are they going to, they're gonna grab a lunch and? Well, when they're in school, they're gonna get uh, a regular hot lunch as if they okay. were in school on a normal basis. Okay. So, Perfect. but I'm trying to make up the difference when they're not in school. Mm -hmm. By having these grab and go sites, we obviously aren't going to be able to deliver. So I'm just going to open probably four sites around okay, the district. Okay, and parents pick up mm -hmm. once okay. a week, so they can come pick it up. Yeah. Okay. And another thing for the future, I know, like when we were talking about the position, we were hoping that you would come in. We did hear some of the different colors, like Larry said, that you were talking about for the younger kids, so they will right. be curious to eat the mm -hmm. food or whatever. My other thought is for the high school kids to expand on um, different types of lunches that they might like a salad the salad bars or whatever creative ideas set. and that's what I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to so sometime in the future if you could put a plan together and let yes. us know I'm all about salad bars I think especially the older kids really enjoy right. you know having the option of a salad bar unfortunately this year there won't be yeah. salad Correct. bars I understand that you know what I mean? but down, going down the road I, I think a, especially in high school they should have at least four or five choices of meals you know, and the lower kids at least three to four choices every Perfect. day of, of something. You know, this, you know, every day we offer peanut butter, every day we offer a grilled cheese, every day we offer a sandwich mm -hmm. or a salad. Um, and then the regular entree that's on. I think all kids should have a choice. Perfect. Thank you. And that's what I wanted to hear. Thanks. Just one other question about the re reimbursement. Is this federal aid or is federal this state and state? Aid? Federal and state. It's both. Mm -hmm. All right. Not as much from the state as the federal. Most of it is federal. Good. I've been working for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how many students do you say are showing up? I just think I have two sites right now, and I think they're up to about 120 a day. Both sites. Yep. And the majority, it's the parents that come, obviously. Yeah, they come. But then the rest are all being delivered. I have a few questions about the one bag per week. You mm -hmm. stated that we would have one grocery bag of meals per week for our students and that there would be no delivery available. Our highest needs students may not have the transportation. So how would you work with our school social workers, our school counselors? How would we ensure that those students are actually fed and not just, okay, you're back right. to school, Absolutely. no food for you? Um, I do have been in touch with transportation. Um, we currently go to three apartment complexes in the district mm -hmm. um, where there's a higher need and the bus is, sits there for a half hour because obviously they can't go to every door. 
Um, I do plan on doing that once kids come back to school because it's only three buses that I would be utilizing for, you know, probably be more like 45 minutes than a half hour to try and meet those needs okay. of those parents. And the grab and go option that you mentioned, is that going to be available for every student or is that just our free and reduced lunch students? And every student. Every student yes. is available to grab and yep. go on their way out of, let's mm -hmm. say on their way out of the building. Mm -hmm. Well, the grab and go, the parents would have to come and pick it up because every building isn't gonna be grab and go. Um, it, it's kind of hard to send a bag full of food, especially with the little kids, you know, on the bus and stuff. So that's why we're gonna have grab and go at four buildings and parents or family members can come and pick them up it wouldn't be is it possible to imagine a plan where it could go home especially with the older students i, um, I mean I that would be the perfect thing to do is to give it to them um but that would you know a lot more planning i'm sure we could make it work um but right now that wasn't on something i was going to do because i don't know how well that would how many kids would want to take it home <laughs> and how it, would get, how it would look when it got home. <laughs> Maybe it's something that we consider at our highest mm -hmm. level to start and right. then. Jody, if I could just add, any family that ever has a problem connecting with the food, they can always just contact our food services department. And kind of as you suggested, we would, we'd work something out for them. So kind of like the same program as offered last year, but it was, it's a good question you're asking. And yes, we would, we'd find a way to work something out for the family, so. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that's something we should make public knowledge because even I was not aware of that. That. Yes, <laughs> it's going to be a combination Everywhere. of both, honestly. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. Are you anticipating a lot of kids, more kids, bringing than currently bring compared to buying? Are you? I'm anticipating more kids taking the school lunch option because they are free. That's, I mean, that's what I'm anticipating is going to happen because it's free for everybody. You, parents don't have to worry about packing a lunch, sending money or anything. If the children will be eating everywhere, how will allergies be handled? Is an allergy lunch just not available to an entire location because student A in teacher B's classroom right. has an allergy, so therefore well, every each student in that classroom is not available that lunch that day? Well, each classroom, I'm assuming, will be together somewhere eating. So we have um, student rosters from the cafeteria, and each roster does have allergies listed that are provided by the nurses. So when we're going to room 102 and we see there's two peanut allergies, the teachers can opt to be a peanut-free room if, if they opted that, or we just would know, make sure those two students did not get a peanut butter meal, which we don't usually sell, send peanut butter as just a meal anyways. It's usually just an alternate meal but allergies are taken into consideration. They will be looking at each, where it's being delivered and what allergies need to be accommodated. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank You've you. had a tough job coming in um, in these crazy times. And we appreciate all your efforts. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sue. Okay, now we're gonna hear a report from another person that's fairly new to the district. Um, our Assistant Superintendent of Exceptional Education, Jackie Fowler, she'll speak about uh, what's going on in our special ed program. Good evening, Jackie. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to maybe adjust the power. Oh, I can leave that on. It's always good to look at some food. <laughs> Um, so I uh, shared with the Board of Education previous to tonight some data and some information in regards to numbers and um, where our programs are across the district, our continuum of services and numbers of students that are in there. I just want to highlight that we have over uh, 1,450 students within our Department of Exceptional Education and includes students who are classified as school-age students with disabilities as well as preschool students. Um, that are ages three to five that receive services, as well as um, over 130 students who have 504 plans. And just speaking about allergies, 
that's often what is outlined in a 504 plan are those students who may have allergies or, or specific health related concerns. So a total of over 1,450 students are supported within this department. So as you can see, we have a variety of different students with different needs um, in many different classes. Some are integrated into general education classes, some are in self-contained classes, which are smaller classes designed to support individual um, student needs. So if anyone has any questions about that information, please feel free to let me know. Happy to talk with you um, about that. Some of the questions that um, were asked of me tonight relate to kind of special education and um, our plan moving forward. So one of, the, one of the questions was about the reopening plan and what does select classrooms mean? So in the first phase of the reopening plan, we looked at um, returning our elementary self-contained classrooms district-wide. So some of them are on the east side of town, some of them are on the west side of the town, west side of town. Those include our 611 classes, our 1211 classes, our 811 class, and our 15 to 1 class at all elementary. So our self-contained students will be returning on um, November 9th in each one of those elementary buildings. Our secondary program included our 611 and our 1211 programs, which include East Middle School, East Senior High, and here at West Senior High. And the reason we um, did not include the 811 programs yet is because many of those students are in, a, in what we call as a combination. So some students who are in 15 to 1 programming, as well as 811 program, also have integrated classes as well. So they may have one or two classes in the self-contained and then other classes that are outside of that that are integrated in general education. So some of that may look a little bit differently, so it's not a total uh, self-contained kind of inclusive model of just being within one teacher and one classroom. Um, our next phase, we'll really look at our 15 to 1 programs at the middle school level, um, as well as our, the 811 programs I just referenced, and then really looking at our um, integrated students as well. Our academic support periods and our resource room periods are separate times when students receive additional support from their teachers and those have been in, up and running right from the beginning. So our special education teachers are involved in our students programming on a regular basis. So at the, the upper grades, they get that additional support as needed. It's built right into their schedule. So it is a, it is a class. Um, as well as the teachers are embedded in the, in the general education classrooms and, and co-teaching with that. That sort of leads to the, the, uh, the next question was about our teacher aides. Our teacher aides, as you all know, are an integral part of our programming. Um, all teacher aides have Chromebooks or laptops so that they can be a part of the Google Meet sessions. Oftentimes they are um, joining a class um, that is up and running. They are supporting the instruction. They're supporting the students. They might be um, collecting data and observing how students are responding. Are they on task? Are they off task? Sharing that data with um, teachers. They're also setting up their own Google Meet. So under the teacher's direction, they might have small groups during a session. They might mark one-on-one -on -one with a student. Some of our one-on-one um, -on -one aides are taking notes for students in class, sharing those notes um, with those families at, at a variety of different times. They also engaged in professional development when we started. So they've all been trained in the Google Suite that, that includes the Google Meets, the Google Docs, the Google Classroom. They really are an, an embedded into the programming that's been happening. So we really have been utilizing our, our teacher aides in a variety of different ways. One of the other questions that was asked was related to something called compensatory services. So compensatory services are services that are provided to a student on an individual basis when services may not have been um, implemented due to a variety of different reasons. And with the COVID closure last year, it created some strain on how to provide services to students. But I just wanna be clear that Compensatory services is not an automatic for every single student. So if a student missed a certain number of sessions of a related service, that doesn't necessarily mean they get those exact number of sessions made up. So I think the question was how many services and what kind do we owe? It's really hard to answer that, but we have a process in place where our special education teachers, our related service providers, anyone who provides programming to our students with disabilities is reviewing how the students are performing currently and how they performed before the closure. So they're really looking carefully at data and information as to where they were and where they're at now 
and then looking at ways in which those supports could be embedded in their current programming if they need to go to the CSC to really discuss what might be needed to address those services, um, really taking into consideration the severity of the child's disability, any previous history of regression, working with parents and the team as to what might be necessary for the student, and really working through that on a case-by-case -case individual basis. So all of the teachers have started that process from the beginning. We shared that information with them during our opening days um, where they can collect that data and really track the student's progress moving forward. So we anticipate there might be some services um, that will be need to be made up for students, but the, how those services look really will be very individualized based on student needs and what, what um, the analysis is of that data. I would say to anyone who has concerns or if you hear of concerns, please reach out to that, to that child's special education teacher um, and move, we can move forward with that. Additionally, our related service providers are also seeing our students in a combination of a virtual teletherapy model um, where they really are, are seeing kids in a variety of different ways. They've started to bring some kids in for in-person services. Um, and I anticipate that will continue even when our self-contains return, what other students might need to come in for some services. Each um, special education student is an individual with varying needs, so we really have to take into account those individual needs and, and move forward with that. Um, the last question was just some key changes in the Office of Special Education. And yes, I started this position at a very unique time. So my plans of getting into the program, seeing students, seeing teachers in action um, were altered because I had started when we had shut down. So that, that I'm looking forward to doing once our students re return. Um, I have been involved in Google Meets with all departments, um, related service departments, special education departments, right from the beginning in March, so getting to know people. So it's nice now to see some people in person, um, going out to the buildings and seeing that. I think one of the main things in the department that I've um, really focused on currently is operational processes and procedures. Really listening and learning as to how things run in the office to be able to make some adjustments or some enhancements and learn a little bit about what's happening. One of the first things that um, we were charged with was when, we st when I started in March was how are we going to finish our annual reviews? So every year a student has to have a, an annual review in order to plan for the following school year. So a large number of them were done given that it was March, but we also had to figure out a way to virtually have the meetings move forward. Um, I have to say, the department came together, including school psychologists, principals, teachers, related service providers, and we successfully completed our annual reviews in a virtual way through Google Meets. I think people saw a little bit of a different side to that because it was um, more streamlined and they were able to get many more meetings done that they had thought that they were, they were getting done. So that I would say is continuing given the circumstance that we're under in terms of not being able to have many visitors in and, and people in person. So we're still maintaining that, that we are meeting with families. It just looks a little bit differently, um, but continuing that communication. With that being said, what we're doing this year is we're phasing in the annual review period to occur within a 364 day window. So typically annual reviews are done from one year from the date in which those meetings occurred the previous year in order to be in compliance. So previously it was kind of done a little bit more globally in the sense that it was done within the school year, but it may not have been within that 364 day period of time. So that's moving us a little bit closer in compliance. So we're phasing that in um, this year. Another thing that we are looking at in terms of um, compliance component is reevaluation. So students must be reevaluated in some way, shape, or form every three years to determine continued eligibility. So there were a couple different processes that were in place in terms of review of um, documents and reports that were done, not necessarily um, completing evaluations every year, not that a student has to be tested, but really cleaning up those processes so it's more systemic, systematic ac across the board. Um, additionally, we're looking at our progress reporting periods and aligning those with the report cards. Some students get them three times a year, some students get the, get the report cards four times a year based on levels and aligning our IEP progress reports with the same period 
for report cards. So those were just some compliance things that, we, that we've put into place moving forward. Um, one other area that we really looked at that, uh, that started right when I started was really establishing what do our special education self-contained programs, what are their goals, what, are, what, what does the program include, and really clarifying the descriptions of those programs. So we started with the 15 to 1 program because that was new and an expanded program at the elementary level and moving into um, East Middle School and really looking at what does this program need to provide for those students who are in that program. Um, we also did that at the, with the 811 programs as well to be able to really define that so that as we move forward and a student may need to access those supports, we know what type of supports are available in each one of those programs. So it sort of clears up when it comes to recommendations, what program might make the most sense for a student or what a student might need based on our programming. Um, the other piece is that really continuing the collaboration with the business office, special education and the business office in, in a school district really need to work hand in hand together because of so many different things that drive reimbursement, that drive funding sources and the way in which things are built from Medicaid billing all the way to high cost stack reimbursement, all the way to students in out of district programs. Are we maximizing our reimbursement? How are we maximizing our reimbursement? Are all the documents in order and clear and consistent so that that reimbursement level can be maximized? That was something that was in place, but really I see the value of that continuing and expanding. Um, we meet on a regular basis to make sure that what is in the IEP is clear, concise, and, and clean data because it drives so much of that billing component. So keeping that up. Um, lastly, really just reviewing the responsibilities within the office. Um, like I said, with over 1,400 students that we service and the multiple people that are involved in the, in the office, we need to streamline some things, make things efficient, make sure people know kind of what their roles and responsibilities are, but yet also include some cross-trading. So that if someone is out and they are primarily responsible for preschool services, who else can we go to? And some of those things are not inherent. Not everyone knows what each other does. They don't have to be you know, you know, they don't have to be very skilled in it to be able to manage it all, but they need to have some level of proficiency so that we can make sure that we can access information in the way that which we need to. That includes also the, the directors, so the director of PPS and the um, interim director of special education, where we work very closely to, to kind of, someone takes the lead on a situation, but be able to consult and collaborate with one another so that we can, you know, be able to bounce things off of each other. So we really have been busy in the office. It's a, it's a busy place with, with many kids, responsibilities, and really um, looking forward to continuing to expand and enhance our programs and services. I do have one question. Um, to go from students, we had 909 in 2019, and now we have two, uh, 940. Are we identifying more students for special ed or are we keeping more students in district rather than sending them out of district? Um, I would say it's probably a combination of both because you see in the chart also I included the number of students that are out of the district. So that is a total number of students with, based on a snapshot right now. So I would say it can be a combination of students moving into the district. It could be a combination of students who are currently in the district that require special education services. Um, and then out of district, we actually went down a little bit, mm -hmm. Diane, from 103 students to 97. I would say the primary goal is to keep students in-house whenever we possibly can. It is unique situations where we may need to access out of district programs for a variety of different reasons. Um, for students. Sometimes students move into the district and they already are in an out of district program. So oftentimes we keep them in that out of district program as they know the student. And then during that year, we would go out and visit the student, get to know the programs and services to see if we can accommodate them in house or if that's a better served program for them. Now that all includes uh, speech therapy at the parochial schools. I mean, we yep. do service quite a few. Uh, private schools with our we do yeah. we do and some of those are our students who are residents here and some of them are students who are non-residents so as a district it, it's under the guidance of what's called the district of location so where the private and the parochial school the location the district in which that school is located 
is the school district that must provide those services. Then there's a whole process which goes to collaborating with the billing office in terms of billing back the district of residence for some of those services. So we also want to make sure that that process is shored up so that we can get appropriate reimbursement for the services that we are servicing here. So they're all included in our total though. They are. Yeah. They are. And I believe I included that on one of the pages in the in the detailed section that we have approximately 44 students in private parochial and charter schools. Charter schools is a little bit different. We are still responsible as a district of residents to support those students. It doesn't fall under the district of location. So yes, it is complicated and it's uh, all encompassing, I would say. Can I ask a uh, sure, couple yeah. questions I have? Um, when was the last time we were uh, audit for Medicaid? You know, I'm not aware of that. That's a really good question. I believe it was within the past few years. Yeah. I, I know that when I spoke with the business office in, in some of my opening meetings, I asked, you know, that where we were with that. And I know it has been relatively recent. I don't know the okay, specific years. I know that's very important to keep it is. all the documentation Absolutely. because that's where we get our federal money from. Absolutely. I know. My other thing too, you said um, every three years for evaluating our individual um, yep. students and that would be the 504s as well as the IEPs, correct? 504s are separate regulations. They okay. try to align with the um, special education regulations so it would be good practice, but it's much looser in regards to that. That comes out of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the okay. Rehab Act. So it's really more driven out of accessibility to accommodations, not necessarily as stringent of the regulations of CSE, but it is a good practice to follow okay, that Because I know procedure. I think you separated the numbers. I did. I, I didn't copy and bring it with me. My oh. other, uh, I, I, that's okay, I have it at home. Okay. But thank you. My other thing um, too, do we subcontract any services out like for? We do, we do have contracted services for some things. So for mm -hmm. example, a student in a charter school may, um, the charter school may contract already with an agency like Buffalo Hearing and Speech Center. Okay. So they don't, may, they may not employ that staff member, but that staff member contracted through the charter is a part of that school on a regular basis. So in terms of efficiency, it would make sense to contract with Buffalo Hearing and Speech who already has a speech therapist or an occupational therapist on site to deliver that service instead of having one of our providers where we would, they would have travel, go there to see the student and come back to our district. Mm -hmm. It would make sense that the student might receive that service there. We also have some unique cases where students are in different programs and may receive some contracted services. So I know, for example, um, if a student is at an out of district program that may not have that service, such as vision or music therapy, we oftentimes contract with an agency or a, a provider to provide that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we, do we have any students at the uh, Batavia School of the Blind anymore? That I am not aware of, but I do know we have students at St. Mary's School for the Deaf. We do. Yes. Yep. We do. We have a wide variety of agencies that our students access. Do you have a copy of the sheet with all the stats on it? I, I do. I have I a few. I can, it has one either. Yep, I can pass those around. Jackie, I have a question in regards to the return of our self-contained students to mm -hmm. school. Um, on the October 23rd update that we received, it states that it's select self-contained special education classrooms will be returning. How was that determined and what is the plan for the non-selected? Well, the selected ones students? initially were our, were our elementary self-contains, as I, as I referenced earlier, that our elementary self-contains are all coming back. So that includes our 611 and our 1211 at Clinton our 811 self-contains at West Elementary, and our 15 to one elementary program at Allendale. So all of our elementary self-contains are coming back. They are. Our, yes, our middle and high school programs are the 611 classes and the 1211 classes at East Middle, East Senior, and West Senior High School. The ones that are not yet returning but are in our plan to return in the, in the next phases are our 811 programs and our 15 to 1 programs at the middle and high school because some of those students access gen ed classes 
as well as those self-contains. So it's not all in an encompassing one teacher type program where those ones I previously mentioned have that design to them. So a student who's in an 811 at a middle school or at a high school might take two courses in the 811 and might take two courses in an integrated classroom. So their schedule wouldn't include just being with that 811 teacher, it would include going to those gen ed classes as well. So is there a date planned for those students to return or are they returning, let's say it is an eighth grader, are they not returning until the January 4th deadline or date? I mean, I think we need to look at that because it's how in which that scheduling might occur in terms of the, the gen ed classes and how in which those gen ed classes are running based on the schedule in which a student may have. It's just a little more unique. Is, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a difference between self-contained and an integrated classroom? Or Absolutely. Or a student who is integrated into gen ed is different than a student who is in self-contained? So at the middle school and the high school level, each class is separated or departmentalized. So for example, I might be a high school student and I might be taking Global 2, okay. okay? If I take Global 2, my Global 2 class might be in a self-contained 811 program. So I might be in a classroom with just eight students, the teacher and the teacher aide, because maybe that's my, my area of weakness and okay. maybe that's where I need that additional support. But I might be good in math. So maybe in math, that's more of my strength, I'm in an integrated class. And an integrated class means there are special education students in there, as well as general education students, but it's a general class. It's, a cl it's an inclusion class, so it's everyone's in there together. Okay. But I might have a special education teacher, which we call integrated co-teaching, push into that class. So that class is actually taught by two teachers, but it's a general education class. So there might be 28 students in the class. I'm one of the 28. I get some special education support, but I don't need to be in a separate setting or a self-contained setting. So that's why at a middle school or a high school, those schedules are extremely individualized. So it's based on where I might go certain periods of the day. I understand that, but that would be a general ed student, not a self-contained student. I'm specifically referring to the special education self-contained students that are supposed to return on November 9th. Who are they and so that's how many a, days per week will they be returning? Is it just the two days based on their cohort? Nope, our self-contained students at the elementary level will all be returning four out of the five days okay. with the Wednesday being remote as everyone is remote and our self-contained students at the high school level, our 611 and our 1211 classes will be attending five days a week. We were able to shift based on the numbers of students in those programs to be able to adjust things so that students could come every day. Did I answer your other question about the integrated two? Not really, but it's, it's hard I understand to picture. that it's a difficult, situ difficult situation. I just didn't understand why it specifically states select self-contained special education classes because if you're on a self-contained class, I would assume that all of your classes are self-contained, but they I'm are not. assuming wrong. They are not at a middle school and a high school level for our 811 program, our 15 to 1 program. Okay. Our 611 and our 1211 are kids who are what we call New York State alternate assessment. So therefore, they're self-contained across the board. So they have one teacher for all, all of their core academics. And those students will be returning four days a week on at November the, 9th. At the elementary level and at the middle and the high school level, they'll be returning five days a week. Okay, but yep. on November 9th. Yep. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thank you, and if any other questions come up, Oh. Thank you. Thank you for no. I was just uh, thank you very much for you know all the information. It's always great for the the board members to understand what's going on in each department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Okay, and we have one last presentation from uh, Dr. Cervoni. He's going to talk about staffing. Uh, with cuts in state aid, we have to look at this very carefully in the next year. Yeah. Um, I did share some data with you, and I, I know it's quite extensive, and, and, and I'm always available to answer some questions for you, but I thought I'd open by just sharing that our staffing process is really, 
there, there are some seasons for it, but it's an all year process. And, and really we, we have our classified staff, which is our civil service staff. Obviously we have administrative staff. Um, and then we have our certificated staff, primarily our teachers and, our, and, our, and that bargaining unit. So uh, our, our staffing process has greatly evolved uh, over the past several years. And it has become a much more efficient and collaborative process where we try to involve several stakeholders in that process. So uh, on a traditional year, let's say as we're working through a, a time of a school year, uh, usually right around our budget time, we are working with our Board of Education and our principals and our superintendent to establish what are the district priorities. What does the financial picture look like and, and perhaps what are our goals uh, that maybe could be met with some staffing changes. Um, we, at that time, our students are also at the secondary level uh, beginning to put out their student requests. They're, they're meeting with their counselors individually. Their counselors are working with them to identify what graduation requirements are necessary or what requirements are to move on to the next year. <clears throat> and also potentially any elective opportunities that they might be interested in. So uh, after we have those requests at our secondary level, our administrators begin meeting with our department chairs and our teacher leaders and then begin to look at how many requests are each student having. Some of those requests are simply, I took Global 1 this year as a, soft, as a freshman, and next year I need Global 2. So we know we have 82 students that are gonna need Global 2. And then we'll also know that we maybe have 72 students that want geometry. And maybe there's 54 students that want business law. And we go through each one of those courses by subject area and begin to establish how many sections would it take to meet those students and stay within our board guidelines. So we begin to establish, all right, how many sections of business law will we need? How many sections of algebra will we need? And you're also looking at how many special education students are needed? How many special ed teachers? How many integrated classroom classes are we gonna need or sections, et cetera? Um, we also have been working with our curriculum cabinet and our directors to sit with our department chairs and begin to look cross sides of town and how can we most efficiently use our staff and find balance? Usually around this time of year in the spring, we're also finding out which of our teachers uh, are putting in for retirement. So we begin to evaluate all of those things together and begin to establish, okay, what are the needs of the district? What are our priorities? Do we wanna continue to offer elective opportunities? What are our academy numbers looking like? What are our core areas looking like? What types of academic intervention opportunities are we going to have? And begin to put all of that data together. So we will have, day-long meetings where I will sit with both principals and or assistant principals. We might have the first hour might be with Mr. DePosco to look at math and we'll have both math department chairs and we'll look, okay, what are the balances? What are all the numbers of the requests that exist perhaps? I'm just talking high school right now on both sides of town for all of our different math courses. How many sections would that require? Our target range is, you know, approximately 25 students uh, on average in a, in a class. And, and look across the board. We might have a situation where, geez, AP statistics is a low number this year, or it might be a high number. Maybe we have, it's tricky, let's say you have 33 kids that want an AP course. What do you do? All right, do we break it down into two sections of maybe 15 and 17? Or, you know, do we have a place big enough to try to run an advanced class with 33 kids, and what does that class entail? We go through each one of those nuances and determine, knowing that, even when we build the schedule and assign staff, there's gonna be conflicts. Students want a lot of different things. Not, you know, we build the schedule to try to minimize those, but sometimes those courses are gonna fluctuate as well. So we go through this extensive process, and typically in the spring we'll do a report to say, what are our targets? Do we need to fill retirements? Do we have goals that have been identified by the district of maybe programming that we wanna add or enhance? Um, you know, I know most recently we made a shift towards increasing opportunities at some of our um, BOCES programming. Uh, and, and how does that have an effect on perhaps our students that are, that, you know, that they leave for half a day? So how does that affect our elective numbers, et cetera? And what type of opportunities does that present for our students? What type of challenges or opportunities does it present with regards to our staffing? So we work through that data and try to determine, is there any staffing needs? Are we balanced? Are we ensuring that teacher caseload is reasonable and class sizes are appropriate for the, for the best learning opportunity? And then we look across between our middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools to determine what type of sharing of staff can we have to make sure that we are the most efficient. Uh, 
Middle school is a little bit less complex because students typically move up by cohort and have uh, much less of elective opportunities. While there certainly wouldn't say it's a simple process, but uh, similar students go through and meet with their counselors, they develop their requests, um, and we sit with our middle school principals, assistant principals, and our teacher leaders at that level, along with our directors as well, and look at what are our middle school numbers looking like. Uh, elementary, uh, which you have the elementary sheets, sometimes those are the most simple to look at, but those are um, based upon uh, really all the kids moving up a grade and then also looking at our kindergarten. We usually use our, our current year kindergarten to project for next year, but that's something that we monitor throughout the spring and even in the summer and right to the end of August and sometimes beginning of September, as sometimes families, they see the buses and like, oh, maybe I need to register. Uh, we have people even coming into our school district at that point. And we'll always take more students, but it sometimes requires an adjustment. And we, I know recently we've had a priority on lower class sizes at our primary levels and we try to begin to focus on that. And if you look at the elementary spreadsheet I share with you, it kind of has kind of what our established board guidelines are, and, and we work together with our principals, our curriculum cabinet members, our directors, uh, and myself to try to say what makes the most sense. What are our course, core classes looking like? What types of additional supports are there based on the needs of our students? We have to take into consideration which ones are our title buildings, uh, what types of needs our individual students have based on the unique communities that our buildings um, support. So usually around the spring is when I am coming and working and identifying and trying to wait and see who may or may not retire and try to make determinations on whether or not we need to fill a position. So every time we have an opening in a position, whether that be classified or certificated, we are evaluating. Is there a need? Does that need to be filled? That is either because anytime we make a commitment to a position, we know it's going to be a long-term uh, commitment. And before we do that, we want to make sure is that where there's money and resources should be spent. Sometimes it's a very simple decision, and sometimes it's a little bit more complex. And we talk about, look at, can we shift staff in any other way to try to perhaps, it's not a goal to eliminate a position, but if a position can be eliminated and we still have appropriate class size and can meet students' needs, that could be resources spent in other avenues to support our students. So. Um, once we make those final determinations and we look at it and we know that they are aligned with our budget and our goals as a district, we kind of confirm or I will work with the buildings to confirm their staffing, to tell them what teaching staff they're going to have and then they can begin to build their schedules and notify their teachers of what they're going to be teaching. Over the summer and late, uh, late spring and into the summer, the buildings then go to develop their master schedule based on the student request, based on the staffing that they were given and then they work through all the different types of conflicts that might exist between students uh, depending on how the class has worked out and it's become even more so a more collaborative approach between buildings and between levels there was certainly a time where east and west <laughs> they had their own fiefdoms now it's a much more collaborative and our teachers are west seneca teachers and our students are west seneca students so how can we utilize our staff to give all of our students cross town the best possible opportunity and the best learning environment as that happens over the summer, uh, there's a transfer process that takes place. Teachers, once they're told what they're teaching, if there were any vacant openings, they can transfer, et cetera, and then school starts in September. Usually around this time, around our beds day, although that shifted a little bit this year, we begin to look at how did we do? We projected to have balanced ca uh, caseload for our teachers and appropriate class sizes, but inevitably, there's conflicts. Inevitably, there are students that come and go or perhaps that want to drop courses, and that's typically something that they'd have to pursue in the beginning of the school year. So we usually will take a snapshot look at our class sizes to say how are our projections, how are our class sizes, are they appropriate, our staffing is relatively set. We very rarely have at least certificated changes or retirements during the course of the year, so that's usually an annual thing. Our aides, our clerical, our, our classified staff, that, I would say that's much more fluid and that evolves over the course of a year as people more often come and go during the course of a year in those positions. Um, and then we evaluate and now as I would say at this point, and, and this data that you had asked is uh, similar to what we have done last year uh, uh, upon your request, but it kind of breaks down and looks at what sections are over 30, what sections are under 13 or under 15. And then we didn't do that for the elementary. I think those numbers are relatively simple, but it breaks down each section at the high, at the high schools and middle schools. And I think what trends you'll see is a lot of our larger electives, music, um, 
a phys ed, et cetera, some of our bigger venues have sections much greater than 30, or not much greater, but greater than 30 in a band, in a per perhaps a large choral group, an orchestra, et cetera. And then what you see is a lot of sections under 15 are sometimes our unique courses. Sometimes they are special ed driven where they're not allowed to have more than 15 students, our 611s, our 1211s, our AISs, our resource rooms. Um, uh, and, and some you'll see that uh, are, are, are right, that they're, they're limited by the type of course that they are. And then there are some that are specialized courses. One of the most challenging pieces is when we perhaps have committed to certain staffing and we have an op elective opportunity that perhaps uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, interest or maybe only has nine or 10 students. And we're faced with the decision of, do we offer perhaps uh, an AP opportunity to students? Um, do we offer it on one side of town and, make, and have give students the option to travel? Uh, or do we offer two smaller sections on each side of town? And we try to evaluate the pros and cons of that to determine what is the best appropriate decision and, and what is our priority as a district to kind of create these opportunities for our students. Um, and there are times where those decisions are a challenge and we, and we work collaboratively to try to make that best decision. And when you, when you commit to a section, you know, what else would the teacher be doing if you didn't commit to that section? And is that value add to our students perhaps worth it? There are times where it's one or two and, and classes have to be canceled. You're not gonna run a class of one or two. It's typically when we get around that 15 mark where we kind of red flag and say, is this, and it's often with our electives, is this a course we wanna offer? Um, and sometimes we wanna offer a course because we know the first year it might be low, but we know that once students are in and begin talking about it, it might gain interest. And we might believe that that's a value to the goals that we want our students to have uh, before they leave us. Um, another thing uh, that you'll see too is sometimes at the middle school, they're teamed. So there's so many teams, like for example, you'll see some examples at West Middle where you have classes right at that kind of 15 border. And you can't necessarily eliminate those courses because then you'd be above 30 uh, in some. So sometimes just the way our enrollment trends work, sometimes you have grade levels or years that maybe have uh, by nature a little bit of a, they're in that sweet spot where you can't really combine and you have kind of really, I guess, friendly course class sizes and some where, you know, like for example, an AP class with 27 students or 28 students where it might be a science AP course where you can run that, but if you split it, it's only 14. That may not be the most efficient use of staff, but running an AP course of 28 students with science labs can also, well, it's a whole another challenge right now with, with our, you know, with, with COVID, but at any given point, and those conversations we have, because if you have one less section, those teachers can be assigned somewhere. Um, I will say you mentioned budget cuts, and you know, in the, in the event that, you know, un unfortunately, our, our largest financial resources spent on our staffing. And when we, our funding is cut, you know, typically the, you know, the, the other expenses you can reduce and cut, but so, you know, unfortunately sometimes the, 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 the biggest cut has to come from our staff because that's our most expensive, you know, um, part of our budget. And, you know, hopefully that never happens, but when those things happen, some data like this and going through and working with our curricular directors, our principals, our board to identify what are our priorities of a district and what could cutting look like? What would that mean if you had to lay off staff, support staff, uh, certificated staff, et cetera? And those are conversations no one wants to have, but it's data like this, current enrollment data, and looking at what types of programming do we value in West Seneca? Those decisions and those conversations would have to be had. Um, so. You know, we, I will say in my time being here, I would say over the past 15, 16 years, we have become extremely efficient in utilizing our staff to the greatest ability. So, and that efficiency has paid off. So when we had a need for maybe a Spanish teacher at a high school, we were able to reflect and look at and realize by working collaboratively and looking at numbers as a district, which wasn't always the case, which, may seem surprising, but I will tell you that wasn't always the case. We can say, well, you know, we can use half a teacher at a middle school and save that position, save having to create or hire that position, um, or at least use, utilize every resource before we make a commitment to filling what is essentially a 30-year commitment potentially, because often people coming in are careers, and we like to think when we bring you in, we're bringing you in uh, to be part of our district for the rest of your career. So we take that process very seriously when we make that commitment. 
sorry, I just thought a little bit of that background would be helpful to you. Um, and, you know, as I kind of look through some of this, I can certainly answer any, any questions you may have. Or at any point, if you want data to look a certain way, much of this lives within our student management system, can be pulled and manipulated to kind of fit maybe the question that you're looking for. Um, and I don't know what's always user friendly. To me, some of this stuff makes sense. But, you know, if you're not living in this, it may not. So, and I also suggested when I sent this out is there may be time where we may want to have our principals come in and talk about certain programming and processes to kind of give you a better scope of how we make decisions and whatever. That, that, that could be helpful. But, you know, certainly um, anytime you want to look at some sort of data or want a snapshot, that can be extracted for you at any point. So don't ever hesitate to ask me. Um, questions, or do you want me to just talk about briefly what these are? I, I think I did, and I know you just got these yesterday, so you may need a little bit of time to kind of look through these. Um, this is uh, something that we update pretty regularly, this opening sheet, which is elementary, which is probably the most user-friendly on the eyes. It lists each teacher, the sections, the board-level guidelines, and then the bottom it talks about some of the psychologists, some of the support services that exist, with, where the phys ed teachers are, the art teachers, the special ed teachers in that building, and actually then lists the actual staff. And what you'll see is the changes. And that changes is much often driven by class sizes. If I know I have a smaller kindergarten, I need one less section. And then the next year, I'm going to need one less section, probably of first grade, and then how that works its way up. So we sit, all five elementary principals, myself, and some of the curricular leaders, and we look at this. And we talk about, you know, what is an appropriate class site? Can we be within board guidelines? Um, for example, you'll see our kindergarten classes, on purpose, have had a great deal of focus on them. Our primary levels, because we made a decision as a board, as a district, that said we believe that, you know, lower class sizes are of a great benefit to our students, especially in our primary levels. And often we can, you know, curtail any learning deficiencies potentially. We can perhaps prevent special education services that a student might, might need by having that, that primary teacher in the classroom in the smaller class size and being able to address that and move a student along academically. Uh, John, do you use, uh, you do use teachers cross Cross district too, don't you? I mean, special area teachers might travel between these. Things. Yes, yeah, we have teachers actually. We have teachers that sometimes travel from an elementary to a high school. Right. Some of our special area That's teachers. Right. We have to be mindful of the certification. Um, and then sometimes between our high schools, we have teachers that will be maybe at a high school every other day. Um, we have sometimes we have string teachers that are in four different buildings. Um, and sometimes when we when it may make sense, we we'll sometimes will travel students. So. Um, you know, sometimes it may make sense to travel a student over for a block or two blocks or maybe they start their day and each student might start their day on West for maybe one of our specialized courses that, you know, you don't want to run two courses at 10. That's not efficient use of staff. So we can run one class at 20 and we just have to build in some travel opportunities. So we really look at whole district all the time. Whole district, yes. yes. To, to use all of our staff. Yeah. And I will tell you, even this upcoming year, we are taking it a next step with our scheduling process where our counselors at both high schools and our administrators are even becoming more lockstep in how they are scheduling and the exact processes they are going through. And I believe we will realize even more efficiencies of staff in creating schedules that are more efficiently made to meet the needs of our students. And by doing that, we may be able to uh, use our, utilize our teaching staff better and also perhaps create other either enrichment opportunities or um, academic need uh, uh, remedial opportunities for our students uh, that have that need. So I will say uh, we are very efficient with our staff. We don't have necessarily ex a lot of excess staff. If you could give me a magic wand, what would I say? I would say I'd love to be able to build additional learning labs and opportunities for our students. That costs money, that costs hiring teachers in every core area. We, you know, we, we are efficient with our staff. Our teachers, for the most part, have full schedules and teach within their contract and, and meeting all the students' needs. So, um, but dealing with staffing issues is a part of my daily job. Sometimes, you know, we have people that go on leave. Sometimes we have additional needs that surface. We have students that are transferring in, et cetera. Um, so it's a constant conversation, but there are certainly seasons to the overall decision-making process and working with each of you to try to determine what can and can't we do and what are our priorities. Could I ask another question, John? Um, I see the elementaries, we have total amount of students in each building. 
could you, I, I don't think, I don't know if you have them off the top of your head, how many students do we have at East and West High and Middle School total? I mean, I guess it would um, be difficult I, to try to I, add I them don't all. know if, I, I will tell you that approximately we have about 900-ish at East Senior and a very similar number at East Middle. And we have about 1,250 at West Senior and uh, about eight or 900 at West Middle, I believe. Okay. Can, um, can we have about, see? we have approximately, I want to say 500 or so at each grade level. Mary, we, should get, we can get you that specific information. Yeah, I, it's I, not difficult to pull. It's very possible. easy to pull. Yeah, Thank last you. year you gave Just me the same thing of this with the high school, so you, you should have another one of these. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, depending on which, oh, the total numbers? Yeah, yeah, I can get you the totals. That, that's easily accessible. Yeah. And what I will tell you is we have a process through our pupil personnel department where uh, I get a, a monthly enrollment report. What students came to the district, what students left the district, and then we begin to update the elementary. The high school um, numbers, overall numbers by grade level, uh, are, we can easily access that instantly. Um, the elementary uh, is a little bit simpler because it's just one grade level. But the high school is obviously is driven by section counts and et cetera, and middle school by teams. So how much have we noticed uh, the change of enrollment with the COVID of parents selecting to go to uh, a public a private I don't public believe school. that we have seen a significant change in, in, in students. I haven't seen, the, the most recent, we actually had a slight uptick. So for the last month, our overall enrollment went up by a couple. Now, I could pull for you maybe exact data or find out you know, how many students potentially went to a parochial school. Um, I will tell you, in, in looking at our numbers and our class sizes, I have not seen or heard of a significant amount, either enrollment significantly dropping on any given level, people wanting to vacate our school. So, um, yeah, that, that's a good thing. If anything, I would say over the years we have seen an increase, um, an increase of students, students leaving parochial and coming to our schools. I know some local ones perhaps have closed, et cetera. But, uh, that is a lot of just by feel. I could probably easily pull that yeah. data and find I out. I look at the, the middle of grade level of uh, eighth to ninth. Yeah. You know, where they're at that level. Where those are those transition points, right, where we you know, students will sometimes come back to us uh, that perhaps we're at an elementary or middle school parochial and want to, uh, you know, come to us for high school. And sometimes often we'll see that reverse, right, whereas they enter in high school, they want to commit to a private school. But um, I can certainly uh, look at some of those trends and pull that data for you. John, I have a few questions in regards to, you mentioned some of our teachers may travel within four buildings in a district. Um, it's rare, but yes, potentially, yes. Like our, our, our strings teacher, for example, may not have many sections at each building, so may travel to two or three buildings. How will that be handled during COVID, ensuring that you are keeping the students that they travel to safe, as well as the teacher yep. safe? Uh, so much is uh, of my job has been recently has been addressing and dealing with kind of safety protocols for staff. So we, we put things in place, screening questions and protocols that we believe our staff are safe when they come and go into our building. So, but by all means, we want to try to limit travel, but uh, and sometimes it will be avoidable, unavoidable. So I think. Those, that exact concern is why we will put some of those safe, why we put our safety protocols in place. We have to maintain a social distance. We have to wash hands. We have to have access to hand sanitizer, portable sinks, PPE, shields, masks, et cetera. So, you know, as you know, our employees have to do a daily screening question. Correct. And then we have our nurses checking and following up with people in the event that they fail to do that, et cetera. And there are constant reminders that I will either send out, the building principals will send out, or signage that is reminding our staff because I think you've all experienced it. Some people will get lax, or some people will let their guard down or become comfortable, and we need to remind our staff, I understand you work with this person every day, but you have to maintain the distance. It's not just about you, but it's the safety of others. So yes, we still will have people travel. Uh, we were in a meeting all day today with our elementary and looking at some of our special area teachers that travel and trying to find are there unique and creative ways potentially to, to limit that. Um, you know, as much as we are challenged with remote and hybrid and having to offer opportunities, um, it also is an opportunity to relook at and be creative in ways that how we meet our student needs and try to focus with a focus on safety. So uh, we are exploring all different options, but there will still be teachers having to travel. Um, we still may have students traveling. 
but we have contact tracing processes that we would work with the county on in the event that we had someone. Um, and we will also have a variety of protocols in place that we believe we are minimizing risk, right? Everything that we can do to minimize exposure and risk to our individuals, to our students is our primary focus. And that's kind of what we continue to remind our staff about um, and we'll be reminding our students and parents about. And when you say that we'll minimize the amount that they are traveling, are our special area teachers traveling into the classrooms? Is, is that the plan? Um, I, I think we'll see a, uh, a variety approach to that depending on sometimes the physical building and how that space is being utilized. Certain buildings, some of our buildings are older than others. They maybe have different classroom space and size and some may need special areas. Sometimes the special area classrooms may be larger. In many ways, we have to reinvent our special areas uh, because some of the added restrictions with singing and PE and such, we may have to be creative not only in our instructional approach, but how we use our physical space. So I would imagine that you will have special areas happening in the special area classrooms. And okay. you will also have maybe examples where special areas are pushing in to perhaps a traditional classroom space and being able to utilize materials on a card exempted to offer an experience to students. So, you know, um, we have a very experienced and veteran administrative team um, and it's of great benefit to us that has that many have worked as teachers in our district, know our community and have a vast understanding and knowledge of unique ways to get at problems. So we are working collaboratively daily to try to find the best way to do that. But I, I think you're going to see a mix. Understood. Thank you. Anyone else have anything else? We appreciate you putting all of this together. It's, yeah. it's important information and it, it takes a lot to absorb it. Well, I value but, your yes. interest in it and, and I am here every meeting, as you know, and if you mm -hmm. ever have questions or need data to look in a certain way, you know that this is a primary function of what I do, so don't ever hesitate to ask. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, um, we are going to go into executive session. Our meeting's over. We're going to go into executive session um, to propose, pen, to, to discuss proposed pending or current litigation and the employment, employment history of a particular person. So can I have a motion to go into executive session? I'll motion. Jody. I'll okay. second. All right. Um, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We will not be coming back after the executive session, but we do appreciate all of your interest in coming today, and um, we hope you have a safe evening, and, and we will let you know as soon as all the rest of the plans are solidified. Thank you very much for coming.